this is the Crappie Connection brought to you by Redneck Rubber, Power Crappie, Visit Ridgeland, b and Poles, K-9 Fishing, Cornfield Fishing Gear, Bobby Garland Baits, Jenko Fishing, Denali Rods, The Direction TV, Top Hat Jigs, Crappie Magnet, Anderson Minnow Farm, Hook and Bullet Purpose Built Optics. Hey guys, Todd Eckby here. We're at the Grizzly Jig 2023 Spring Show. And the reason why it's just me and Brad and the reason why I kicked this off is because I'm getting ready to interview him for y'all. You know, this is something that Todd and I have talked about for a while, and I think he's been really looking forward to doing this for me. Or doing it towards to you. me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, I like the idea of it. I like, uh, we have questions about this all the time, and hey man, I'm open like a book good good so what we're going to talk about today is something that is new to me and my part of the world and it's what you do every day it's how you you made your living yeah yeah i mean i've been long lining jigs i guess i'm gonna say 12 plus years 12 14 years and um earl brink kind of started it out for me and a guy named kenny browning and back in the day when I started fishing Magnolia Crappie Club, and I can't even recall the year, 06, 07 maybe. And they came in and really dominated us one complete tournament season by long line and jigs. And we kept looking at them, my old tournament partner, Bo Hudson, and we were like, man, that looks extremely fun. <clears throat> and we know it's effective because they're they're kicking our butts doing it and we were spider rigging at the time like you know 95 percent of the field um but those two guys are my mind some of the best original long liners there was but we uh dedicated our whole summer after tournament season was over with and really kind of perfected it and uh you know add our own little twist things and (coughs) uh, fine-tune our way of doing it and uh fell in love with it and you know, I fish, I still do it, and I still got a live scope, but it's one of my things. I can turn that live scope off. And uh, there's a lot of people envious of that right now. Yeah. You know, and it goes back to the terminology to me when you think of fishing. You know, before live scope, live sonar, whatever, you know, you looked at the maps a lot. You looked at, number one, you looked at your side scan and down scan and, and actually your maps more than anything else or i did you know i looked for where the shad was i I looked for you know the contour breaks and you know some different (coughs) things that are not as i can't say not as important but to to do long lining and these old school techniques you had to really find uh those features more than looking at a graph uh, live sonar anyway so when when you're long lining yep which is most important cover or structure and to, <laughs> to explain that to people because everybody gets it wrong cover is a brush pile is a anything that a crappie can use to cover conceal itself structure is the bottom of the lake meaning a ledge right a drop off whatever you want to call it ditches yeah <clears throat> You know, both of them will play a role in different lakes. Um, you know, as far as the structure, and you're talking about a ledge where it, you know, changes from deep to shallow or any kind of really sharp depth change, a contour line to say, 
I've always highly focused on contour lines. Um, in my mind, a contour line is a highway for a crappie to travel, especially winter and in the spring season. Wintertime, probably not as much, but in the spring and when they're, they're on the move to different areas of the lake, a contour on a lake is, you know, just like a major interstate for me, in my opinion. So I always really concentrated heavily on contour breaks. You know, my Lake Ross Barnett, I'm looking for a contour from 10 to, I'm going to say, let's say 10 to 15. I want where that top side's 10 foot and the bottom's 15. It could be anything else. But that sharp depth change, that depth contour is always been a really productive spot for me to pull my jigs across okay so once your baits are out yep. out, out the back of the boat yep you got them 60 80 100 foot behind you you know <clears throat> and, and i had a customer in grizzly jig this weekend and he heard a seminar seminar of mine a couple of years ago and he, he still gives me you know heck about it but a really good cast and and i'm talking 60 to 70 feet is probably where it is the cast length is not as big of a factor as the speed of the boat and the size of the jig heads right so if if, if you're running too deep you can speed up you can to speed it up that. to to a certain amount i mean i feel like i can pull jigs as far as the depth that they're being trolled i can pull them two foot deep all the way to round 20. And once you get to that 20 below, I, I, and you could do some different things to get them that far, but to get them past that 20 foot mark is really, really challenging because you have to slow down so much. Have you ever tried lead core? We did play with lead core a little bit <coughs> and it would get them down. Um, I don't know if it inhibited maybe the action of the jig somewhat, uh, or we just <coughs> didn't take enough time to really concentrate on it because typically the areas that i fish you know either they're going to be high in the water calling and most of the time it's going to be forward about 12 foot deep is most of the time the depths that the active fish feed for us so are are you running one jig or multiple baits up yep. on we trod you know if i'm wanting to get extremely shallow and i'm talking that two foot and crappie get that two foot a lot i'll use a single 30 second and that's where i'll start out as far as my lightest <laughs> Uh, 90% of the times I'm going to run double jigs and they're going to be tied with loop knots and there's a bunch of videos that, that I've done with that as well but I'm going to use two jigs and they're going to be tied about uh, I'm going to say three to four foot apart and on the bottom jig I wanted to have about an inch loop you know on that jig and then the top jig head itself is going to be I always measured about the height of my belt belt so i want a consistent distance between my jigs and then i'm gonna use a, another loop knot as far as the top jig and about a four inch loop knot just to kick that jig away from that main line a little bit do you like baits that have a lot of action yeah. as in a curl tail or something yeah. so like the bait that i use that beaver bottom is right. not good for long line. no it wouldn't be for me um i would use a beaver bottom you know something that has a, a buoyancy to it when especially when it's being pulled because it's just creating more of a drag to really get high high in the water now i would use something like that to get extremely high in the water column but day in and day out i want a curly tail and everybody knows that knows me it's going to be the bobby garland stroller just because it's a big curled tail but it actually has a, a paddle on the back side that generates a little, kicker. a little kicker. It generates that vibration as well to it. <clears throat> so once once your lines are out yep. and you're going, yep. how far do you go before you have to stop or turn around? Or Yeah. Well, the number one thing, once you start this motor up, this, your trolling motor, and I'm not going to stop it at all, no matter what, until all the lines are back in. So once I kick it on and set my speed, I have I'm get my speed to the to, to the range that I'm looking for, which is about 1.2 nine times out of the ten. 
I'm going to get it to 1.2. I'm going to cast out my shortest pole on each side of the boat first and stair-step myself, you know, 7 foot, 10 foot, 14, 16, or whatever it might be, whatever your combination is. But I'm going to start at that center pole, cast them out, one, two, three, four, and then I won't pull them back in. I mean, excuse me, I won't stop the boat until I have them all pulled back in. So if you ever stop, the first thing that happens is they all go to the bottom. Right. And then, you know, in some lakes that would be fine, but more than likely you're just creating more work for yourself if you ever stop it. But how long of a pull will you make? Does it depend on if you it run de- out of fish? It depends on the contour ahead. line, you know. And <clears> then <throat> there's a big difference, and we both know as far as if I'm fishing tournaments, you know, or we're out there pleasure fishing or guiding, I'll try to run an area at least a half a mile long. Which would, you know, so about a 30-minute pull. Yeah, about a 30-minute pull. But then even at that point, as long as I have enough area – on the ledge and you know it's kind of what I, I guess i'm hitting on there but i'm gonna kick the boat over to the deeper side of that ledge and start a gradual turn and a and a turn you know it's not a, a whipping motion by no means it is a slow process and that's one of the reasons i use high vis line is so i can see those lines and get them as close as i can just to get a tight turn but not touching because if they ever touch on top of the water, guess what they're doing underneath the water? They're spinning together at that point. So I'm going to do a, a gradual turn until I can get back right back on that same contour, or if that's what I'm fishing and that's where the fish are, and and, and hit that same path again. In, a, in these big lakes or anywhere you're fishing, most of the time you have a, a really big area that you can fish. You know, I think that's... Um, a misconception that all the fish are in one area and my mindset they might be on the same area as far as that contour but that contour could really run for endless miles okay so let's say you do a half mile pull and you're headed north okay and on that pass in a half hour you catch 10 yep how many times if you turn around and reverse that do you have the same results a lot um i've even seen it increase and right well that's that's what i'm saying mm-hmm. is do you see a direct deal of when we go this way we catch 10 we come back we catch 15 gotcha. we go that other way catch 10 come back catch 15 some days yes a lot of the times no um you know early morning i try to troll into the sun it's just from, I guess, some of the, the wise guys in, in, in my mind that started out crappie fishing. You know, they always fished in the sun. I like fishing in the sun. Um, but, you know, once the sun gets on up, and I'm talking two or three hours after daylight, I haven't really paid that much attention to say, yeah, it made a really huge difference. There has been times, but most of the time I'm looking just to pick off active fish as we're coming by them. And this technique is kind of like if you have a lab retriever dog and his natural instinct is to retrieve and he's been trained and all of a sudden I sit here and I I throw a tennis ball. His natural instinct is to go get that bait unless he's sleeping or anything, but his natural instinct is to retrieve and these fishes natural instinct is when this bait the vibration they can feel it coming or see it coming and all of a sudden it's the right color what have you they see it coming by them their natural instincts just to dart up and grab it it's not a big thought process um so i'm exploring or or not exploring necessarily I'm, i'm really picking on their their instincts to attack something and the more active fish that are feeding in there and see something coming by, their natural instinct is just to, to attack it at that point. So I might come through an area and get the active fish at that point, make maybe 30 minutes before I get back to that same area. And we have more fish at that time than turned active. So, you know, some days, hey, 
people say, well, do you need to fish out here at daylight? No, you know, I've seen bites that, yeah, it's been better at daylight, but most of the time we can catch them throughout the day. How many other types of fish do you catch as a result of doing this? <laughs> you know, the other one that we catch a whole lot of, and, and it will shock, or it shocks a lot of people when they get in the boat is catfish. We don't catch that many bass. I probably can count on my hand unless it's, now I went to Toledo Bend several years ago and we caught a lot of bass down there doing it. But day in and day out, <clears throat> I bet I hadn't caught less than half a dozen bass throughout the year. And they don't suspend very often. Yeah. And, and you know, I don't know if it's the size or what have you, but uh, very rare we'll catch bass. We'll catch a few gaspagoos and a lot of catfish. I'd say it would probably be, you know, catfish would be the second biggest thing that's going to bite them. That's, that's interesting. I would have figured it had been white bass. No. And they will as well. Luckily, I don't have that many white bass in the lake that I got on. So some of these oxbows that we do fish have a, a lot of white bass and and they will definitely wreck them uh <laughs> they'll keep you busy but day in a day out I ain't, I ain't catfish and even on that subject something that really keys to me in my mind is i can tell a person once they get uh, a strike on their pole if it's going to be a catfish bite or a crappie bite a catfish bite he's going to bite it and it's just going to vibrate extremely violent and then it does settle down but when you get the pole up and you're actually reeling him in at that point he's going to spin mm -hmm. he's just going to sit there and spin as he's coming in if it's a big one he's going to stay down and fight but a crappie no matter three pound plus he gets the bite you know you see the bite on your pole it comes back you set the hook a crappie I would venture to say 99% of the time he's going to come to the surface. And just ski back there. Yep. Well, he's going to pop up first off. And if he's a, a really, really big fish, now it might dive back down and you'll have to fight him. But first thing he's going to always do is going to come to the surface. He's going to pop up. So for people that haven't done this before that get started, mm -hmm. You run how many rods? Eight rods? Eight eight poles every day. Okay, so let's say you get number eight out. Yep. And number one and two are hung up. Yep. What you do then? <laughs> uh, well, you know, if there's a lake that has structure and I fish where a lot of structure is, cover, what have you, and we break off a lot of jigs, um, but I'm going to retie that pole and I'm going to cast back out there. And what, what, but what, as soon as it gets hung up, what's your action? Because <laughs> you're because you're, you're, you're not going to slow down. No, I'm not going to stop. Okay, so you've obviously got some drag. Yeah, pretty loose. Yeah, well, it's not too loose. I mean, it'll start pulling drag just barely. It's going to get to the point that you do have to grab the pole, and I face the pole directly towards the hang up. Right, you just point the rod at I'm it. Gonna, and just I'm going to pick it, it up and point it right to it. And I'm going to let that drag work a little bit and just kind of pull it a little bit. And you can pull them off there sometimes. I would say well over half, you're going to lose that jig. And it's good. I mean, you know, to me, is if I can't afford to buy new jig heads, you know, I probably don't need to be fishing. But um, It's good for the manufacturers. Or yeah, I mean, that, I guess that's why they love me so much. But, um, you know, you're going to break off you're going to have to, some tangles and you know somebody starting out another big thing that I, I suggest for somebody is i always vary my line color and now my number one pole and we're talking just say the right side of the boat my one two three and four pole my number one pole let's say i have uh i'm gonna say clear line my number two pole i want high vis line and then my number three i'm gonna go back to clear line and then my number four i'm gonna go back to high vis line and the number one reason i want it just like that if i'm starting out is that you're going to have some tangles that you're going to come across by doing this technique as you're learning it especially but it's a lot easier to get two different color lines untangled compared to one 
of the same color. So if you got them two different colors, literally it, it's a lot easier. And really now I just cut them off and retie them because I can tie them pretty fast. But um, but if you're starting out, that's a good way to learn, you know, how to untie them by different color lines. And I want that that high vis color on the outside pole so I can see that turn better. So as I'm turning that boat at the end of that run, if I have that high vis, I can track it a little bit easier than a clear line. So that's my deal on lines. In line size, that's probably somebody thinking, six pound test is my bread and butter. You know, you can manipulate your jigs based on line size, and I have, depending on you know, lake conditions, crappie conditions, you know, I feel like with six pound test, I can get them, you know, about three foot deep is about the shallowest I can go. But it, let's say there's fish 12 inches deep. Well, if I switched over as high as up even to 15 pound mono and use a single 30 second, those jigs are really gonna go higher. So I can take them from that three foot, pull in that 1.2 and increase my diameter size and bring those jigs up even higher. Are you a planer board guy? No, no, no. <laughs> Have you ever tried it? Yeah. You know, Tommy Scarless, which he's <clears throat> passed away now, he fished a national championship in, uh, on Grenada. I can't remember the year. And he, uh, he used planer boards and he, he, he killed us down there and i got into planter boards shortly after that like most everybody that was fishing tournaments at the time i got a set of them do you <laughs> and uh you know they're very effective and he proved that mm -hmm. tommy scarless proved that planter boards and crappie fishing was extremely effective it also proved to me that they were a lot of work mm -hmm. and especially taking people out and you know what i mean when i say you're taking people out and you, it's already enough of work to do it. It's a lot of work to pull planter boards. So do, do you ever see days where no matter which side of the boat, mm -hmm. but your outside rods are out producing yep. the inside rods because, because your boat is spooking those yep. fish to the outside? Yeah, absolutely, especially the shallower they get. It has always seemed to me that, uh, and that's why I like an 18-foot on the outside, and, um, you know, those outside poles, especially as those fish got shallower, were more of a factor. And, you know, that's one of the reasons I like long line for all these years because, you know, you'll go over these fish and they might go down or they might even spread out and that's where they usually would get those outside poles. But if you have those jigs that far behind the boat, it gives them time to actually come back up. So if they go down, which is fine, and we can't prove that until live sonar, but we always felt like they kind of went down when we went over them. But at the time they got back to the jigs, and that's why we had them long lined out, is it gave them enough time to come back up and actually hit that bait at that point. You know, speaking of Tommy, and I spent a lot of time with him. We had yeah. mutual sponsors for years. We traveled all over, and, you know, his, his nickname was Hollywood because he yeah. was bigger in life. Yeah. And, I asked him one time, because he came, you follow a few times, and we filmed some stuff for Pradco, and <clears throat> he called me during that Grenada deal. Mm -hmm. And he was like, dude, I may be fixing to show them something. Yeah. And I said, that, he did. that would be awesome. So when it was over, he called me immediately and told me that he did it. And I was like, cool, you know, enjoy it. Go talk to everybody. Mm -hmm. Call me in a little bit. And I asked him. And that's why I asked about those outside rods. Yeah. He said, those fish at Grenada, like we all know, they run from your boat. Yeah. They're also fairly shallow, mm -hmm. even though they may be in deeper water. Right. And he said, I am purposely scaring these fish. Now, this is before live sonar, but this was his thought. And now we know it to be true. Yeah. He said, I got my big motor running. I got, I'm making a lot of noise and I'm scaring these fish out to where my planer boards are running <laughs> it makes sense now yeah 
he said, I'm actually position. I'm like parting the waters, yeah. positioning these fish to where my baits are. Mm. And that's really interesting, you know, with the long lining and stuff, yep. because I could see that those outside rods yeah. just doing what I do and knowing, you know, all right, there, there's always a fish over here and over here yeah. out of my reach. Right. You know, even turns, you can kind of manipulate that some. And um, I remember <clears throat> that tournament, and I remember those conditions extremely well. I know where Tommy Scarless won, and a lot of other people do too, mm-hmm. but he won it on Carver Point, which is a big main lake point of that lake. Uh, I want to say it was in August or September, and some guys will probably correct me on that, but it was later summertime. And I mean, I found those fish out there just like the, he did, but I couldn't get them to bite. And uh, I remember after that day one tournament, and everybody coming in I was like, "Man, you see that guy out there playing, doing them planer boards?" And I was like, "Yeah, I don't know what the world he's doing." And they were like, "He is whacking them." And they was like, no, "Surely not." And sure enough, he weighed in, and he he had a I don't know what the actual pounds was at the time, but he had a really heavy sack. And he set the crappie fishing on world at that point with those planter boards, but pulling out of the back of the boat. Oh, yeah. I mean, th- that was definitely one of those where, you know, and, and we've talked about it, like our sport has kind of be- the same thing over and over and mm-hmm. over again. And he was probably the first person in 20 years to do something uh, completely out of the box. Yeah. Yeah, he did. And it was a... Uh, I mean, it was good. It was cool. And then I learned how to pull planter boards. I fished them a couple of tournaments. I never did win any doing it. Uh, I guess I wasn't all that good at it. But uh, I did learn that technique, and I figured out pretty quick, day in and day out, that's a lot of work. And, and it's, like I said, it's effective, especially on shallow, suspended fish. It's extremely effective. So when, when you're turning around, mm-hmm. Do you speed up or slow down at all? Or no. Do you keep that exact same pace? I, You're just making a very wide right. loop. I, I keep my my cruise set at a certain mile per hour. But what what if the wind is blowing one direction and, and no, you know that's one reason I run a deeper V boat is my boat pretty much sticks down in the water, and I, I'll set my and I've ran all the different manufacturer trolling motors through the years doing this but i want i'll set my my speed to a certain speed and that would more than likely be 1.2 and the boat will adjust itself if it's starting to go too fast it'd cut back that trolling motor or if it's going too slow it would speed it up on the prop so it kind of takes the guess what trolling me. motor you use now i'm using a garmin force i've been using those for about three years now but before that was the Ultrax, and then I think before that the Tarova and all those trolling motors, you know, definitely help out. I don't know if you could really do it without, um, effectively anyway, a wireless trolling motor. That's probably one of the things you 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 definitely probably need. So your trolling motor is hooked up to your GPS, which is helping control yeah. your speed. It controls the speed. It controls it. You know whether it needs to cut it back some or you know speed it up some but uh, a remote control that way i can sit in the back of the boat i'm not sitting up there at all with the my trolling motor it's pretty lonely while long line um, but i'm sitting towards the back of the boat and uh you know just controlling it with my fingertips how many, how many times you turned around and looked in front of you and oh, there'd be a boat pulled in and a you're bunch. like oh my god a we're bunch. about to run into this yeah. dude buddy of mine uh, michael hanfelder he uh, helped me guide for a couple of years and on lake washington and we were catching fish just you know like hank said like they're going out of style and he actually ran into somebody's pier <laughs> he he was pulling along and 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 you know you get so caught up by pulling in fish and reeling them in and he said all i heard was boom and the boat stopped and he turned around and he was pinned up against a pier he done run completely into it and it stopped the boat flat out and and, i mean i don't know if he even almost got whiplash (laughs) from that but i can see it and i was out there and i was like you're kidding me he's like ask my guys and i was like oh no he, he smooth ran into this pier that's great. Yeah, I mean, I had I didn't do it, but yeah, there's been occasions that you turn around and oh, oh my God, I'm about to run over this guy, um, 
and it's always been really neat for me and I, I loved fishing around spider rigging guys i love to do it because i could catch fish and then like i said i make these long runs and i could see them all sitting in a particular section of the lake well i would come through there and we'd catch a couple of fish well we continue catching fish as long as it's on that same contour 95 percent of the time so all of a sudden they'll look at me and i'm on the other end where they're not fishing any longer catching fish and they'll start gravitating that way and, time and, then, they, and then you and, and that's and right and time they get back again. we're heading back right where they were and they're like oh my god and then we get down there we catch fish so we kind of yo-yo people back and forth through the years and that was always really cool to do <laughs> i guess kind of i don't know childish almost but it was fun i still do it so I'm, with this technique mm -hmm. how many fish an hour on average you know it just depends on the bite um um you know probably the funnest tournament i ever fished was in december which you would think it wouldn't work and it did very 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 well we had and it was a border like it bordered on louisiana and we could keep 50 a person so that's why we me and my partner had so many but we caught 88 keepers that morning threw back no telling how many but during that one tournament and we only could use six poles at the time we had all six poles with fish on them at one time three different occasions and one of that times we actually had seven fish on at once with six poles out and when i got home i missed winning the tournament just by merely nothing uh i actually think i know who won it terry stewart but um we got home and i weighed in i had over 28 i had 28 over two pounds and i was like man and i was like i started to go back through and weigh them again and i was like no because i just probably just screwed myself here uh, because we were catching so many fish so fast but one of the things that i, I want people to, to think about when they think about if they want to do this kind of technique is i can put somebody from as long as they can hold a fishing pole if they can hold a fishing pole I can put them in my boat, but my boat, and as long as they can reel, the age is endless. I've taken people in their nineties. So, so th this technique to me is great as a guide because yep. if you can sit under a shade tree, you That's can right. long line. Yeah, if you can hold a pole and reel it in, I can take you and you will catch fish with me. So. You know, your clients get to, we've already, I make fun of yeah. you. Yeah. You get to sit down Absolutely. in the shade with the pan. High five. I, and with I'm the a fan net man. turned on. I'm the net man in my boat whenever I'm pulling jigs. I'm the net man. Of course, I operate it too, but, and, and usually the untire. I, I'm really good at untying jigs. Um, but, you know, you can take anybody and you can fish from a lot of different boats. I mean, if you have a pontoon boat and you've got you a, a nice trolling motor on there, you can use pontoon boats and do this. You know, you can use small boats to do this. Uh, another really big advantage of doing this is when the conditions aren't favorable. Um, my favorite tournaments to fish in the old days, whenever it was 15 plus miles an hour, I wanted that high wind because it messed everybody up that was spider rigging because it kept their poles to bouncing. Well, that bouncing action, whenever those lines are stretched really out, does nothing but help my bait. It doesn't pull them out of the strike zone. It gives them maybe even a little bit more action. But it's not to the point that it pulls it away from them by no means. So, uh, you know, two to three foot swells on a lake, man, I, I love it. It did not bother me. It still doesn't bother me. Because if if, as long as that bite is there, I, I can catch them in just about any condition. You know, that, that's something I had never thought about as far as a deck boat or a pontoon boat being yeah. able to do this because I, I I actually get a lot of people that will see me at a show and they're like, hey, man, I'm wanting to get started fishing and I got a pontoon boat. Yeah. And I'm like, I yeah. can't do what I do. Right. But you could do what you're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's a lot of guys that I've seen through the years and that pull crankbaits and jigs and different things but this trolling technique this long line trolling is um 
you know, it works great on a pontoon boat. It works great on a small boat. And, you know, I think of fish and steel that I think we've taken it uh, on the tournament side for sure. We've taken it to the point that we've got to catch the biggest fish. We've got to catch the most fish. Well, we've taken the fun out of We're, it. We, you know, we've, this we've, is still we've a fun it, technique. We've made it more competitive, but yeah. we've taken all the enjoyment yeah. out. Yeah, you know, I can sit back in there and we can have this same conversation as as our poles are being fished and being... You bring sandwiches and stuff? I, well, I don't do that. I'm not a very good sandwich maker, actually. Well, I want to come down and do it with you. Yeah, I mean, it's cool. I mean, it really... Um, and I have a lot of people that just want to come just to sit back in long line. I, and they want to learn this technique. And I don't know how many, probably thousands of people I've taught it to. And... Uh, you know, I see people now, when I would go to a lake in the beginning, I would have the strangest looks ever. Because, you know, me and my buddy were sitting in the back of the boat, pulling these baits out of the back of the boat as we're going along. Running into people's docks. Well, I hadn't done that yet, knock on wood. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we're covering water. Another thing that this technique can do for you especially on a new body of water and everybody wants to say you know how do you break down a new body of water is as i'm trolling out of the back i'm still running side image and down image so if you get me on a new body of water and i look at a break line that i found fish on a particular break and i'm talking let's say eight to 15 foot and i key in on that break line and it goes around i don't care if it's eight miles across that lake and as i'm pulling my jigs i'm looking at my units i'm looking at my down image and my side image as i'm going through there i'm marking on my my waypoints onto my units throughout the day so in theory if i'm going 1.2 and i never turn around on a new body of water i would never turn around and fish the same area twice because i just want to learn it well i could go through there and hit eight plus miles on a contour break on a new body of water well if i fished it for five days i'm i can cover literally 50 miles of that contour i did that a few lakes pulling crankbaits yep and i did it specifically back before we had any side imaging yeah to try to find something to get hung up in. yeah yeah i'd pull crankbaits till one of them got hung up it's like oh there I'd, it is i'd push that button and stop try to back up let all those other crankbaits come to the top yep. reel them in and i'd go back and i would mark what i got hung up with yeah with like a water bottle right. out there in the middle of nowhere because we didn't even have gps back <laughs> right. then so it i can see how it'd be a great you're you're graphing and fishing at i'm the same graphing time. non-stop and fishing at the same time and uh, i think on my unit right now just on the ross barnett i don't know how many stumps and brush piles i got marked i know around three thousand. And that's all, I mean, I don't have to just say side scan. I can side scan and crappie fishes at the same time on somewhere new. That's awesome. You know, Lake Hamilton, we were talking about that lake earlier. And uh, I still have nightmares, I guess. But uh, anyway, we long lined. And that, I, see, that was a dock you should have ran into. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt. I should have. But we long lined that lake, and I found, I want to say it was around 150 brush piles as i fished now did i really do good in that tournament no but i could go back to that lake now and utilize some different techniques just because i long line and i was fishing at the time and and i marked so many waypoints that i would have never found or didn't have to take a time just to sit there and side scan i was fishing as i was side scanning pretty much yep that's awesome yeah another thing that i would love to for people to do more of and I get the opportunity, just, I'm sure, as you do as well. I, I do a lot of trips where people ask me to teach them how to, you know, run their sonars, uh, you know, how to long line jigs, how to live scope, how to, you know, whatever. But one of the things, and this is a tip that I want to give people, is waypoint management. Now, I don't know if we ever talked about this, Todd. I'm super, I know we probably have. But... As I go over structure and I see a small stump, I'm going to hit a waypoint, but also I change 
the color of it. My shallow way, my small stumps on my unit, it's going to be green. A, a big stump is going to be red. My best stumps, and um, don't anybody <clears throat> get in my boat and steal these spots, are my gold spots. My best stumps are my gold spots on my color of my uh, waypoints. I have deep color waypoints. Anything blue on my unit, and I, like I said, if you steal my boat, you'll know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> my, my deep waypoints are blue. So I went through there and thought, and I would probably change it up if I was going to do it from beginning now, but uh, I went through there and said, all right, I know what green's going to stand for. I know what red's going to stand for. Gold, yellow, purple, all these different color waypoints have a different meaning. And the big advantage of that for me is that I can say, all right, I'm catching them off green waypoints, which is a small stump for me. Then I can look at a whole area and say, all right, I'm going to really just target my green waypoints mm -hmm. and then on down the line. But that's a big tip if you want to get into crappie fishing. Yeah, we need to talk about that for about an hour because I'm sitting here yeah. and my mind's turning <laughs> fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I love that kind of details. And, you know, as crappie fishermen, we all have said it so many times, it's all about details. Mm -hmm. All about details. And... Your average fisherman pays attention to none of them. Yeah. And then, you know, I have people that get in the boat and they'll say, and they'll see my screens because, I mean, we're, they're fishing right there with me at the time. And they say, man, why do you got so many different colors on your waypoints? And I explain to them and they're like, man, I ain't never thought about that. And, but that's the reason behind it. Mm -hmm. But I can go back and look at, uh, let's say, Sardis Lake. And I hadn't been as Sardis in four to five years. But I've still got, I don't know, probably three or 400 waypoints from Sardis that are color-coded that I've, like I've been doing for 10, 12, 15 years, whatever it is, that I can say, all right, I need to concentrate on these gold spots and go right back to them across that lake. Yep. And see, on my lake, we got rock, mm -hmm. we got stake beds, right. standing timber, yep. brush piles. We got all kinds of different stuff like that that I mark. Yep. And like you said... As far as deep or something like that, <clears throat> one, one of the and I picked that up years ago whenever I was bass fishing. Yeah, and I asked one of the best bass fishermen in the world. I said, you know, how can we have such an advantage over everybody? And he said, yeah, I'm not going to tell you that. Well, a few years later, <laughs> I ran into him, and he came and he said you know he said i thought about that and he said i'm gonna answer you and i said all right and he said when i go to a lake i try to cover the entire lake yeah i don't care about catching a fish come tournament day if i catch a fish off of a dock that's in eight foot of water i know where every dock on this lake that's in eight foot of water is at not the ones in 20 foot right the ones in eight he said i can duplicate it because i already looked at everything and so you know now especially with gps where we can mark that stuff that's really important oh they're invaluable i mean my waypoints to me that and I'd, I'd rather my live scope go out than my gps me too. I, yeah. I can fish with that live i scope. can too you take yeah. my gps away from me and sometimes i'm like oh you know i could probably get me pretty close but as far as having those you just waste a lot of time you waste more time but i know with, with you give me my really my my maps with my gps spots you can take away just about everything else and i feel like i still could catch fish oh yeah and then and anybody else can do it i mean we're not holding in any big secrets there is we're telling you what we're doing with mm -hmm. it oh yeah and more than likely i could get in your boat with your gps yeah. and go catch yeah. them on your spot oh, absolutely and there's no doubt especially now since you know gold is so good oh yeah <laughs> there's no doubt that you oh, could yeah. cause, I I, mean, hey the last boat that i sold I sold it because my guy said, I'll pay that for that boat, but you're not deleting those out of you're your right. console. You yeah. And I said, okay, just one dude. He ain't going to sell them to anybody. Yeah. And I got so many marked, but that stuff's valuable. It, it definitely is. I, uh, uh, 
you know, it takes a long time to get all those kind of waypoints and I save them and I back them up on SD cards. I probably knew I hadn't done that in about a year now, but uh, anyway, I have all my units linked together and I have a unit on the very back of my boat. I run a unit at my console and then I run a unit off my bow and they're all interlinked together. So now, now no matter what technique that you I'm running doing, all Garmin, no, I'm running all Lawrence and I've been the Lawrence guy for, uh, I don't know, 10 plus years, 15. I, I don't know. I started out with Lawrence and now I've got so many waypoints on my Lawrence units that will not transfer, will not transfer to Garmin. That's what's holding me back. Probably. Yep. I, I'm, I'm right there. Yeah. The, my, I just now came down to two manufacturers, mm -hmm. Humminbird and Garmin. My last boat, everybody Third. was like, what in the world? Because I had a live scope. Yeah. Lowrance for GPS up front and right. Humminbird for side imaging. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, I thought about the whole um, switching the Garmin over from other units. And the only thing that's ever really held me back. is transferring waypoints. Transferring waypoints. Because they are money. Mm -hmm. Dude, enjoyed it. <laughs> You've been wanting to grill me, Todd. I mean, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down and get in the boat. Uh, yeah, I will do it. <clears throat> You'll be I, out there in Oklahoma with a long line. I've thought about it and thought about it and thought about it, but when you told me that you had fans in your boat, yeah. now I'm going yeah. Got fans. We've got shade. We just got to teach you how to make good sandwiches. And I'll be there. <laughs> I'll see what I can do about that. All right. Till next it. time. Todd Huckabee. Brad Chapel. Oh. From a big muddy river, a place I'll always remember. A cabin on the lake and a fishing pole. Forever here, I'll rest my soul. I can